Well, welcome to another special episode of the Bring Your Own Grief Network Studios. I am your honored and humbled host, Art Glenn Kelly. You know, this is the Bring Your Own Grief Network, where you bring your own questions, bring your own feelings, and always bring your own opinions. We are all as unique as snowflakes and fingerprints, aren't we? And no two of us will ever grieve alike. Nor are there any one-size-fits-all answers for anyone's journey down this path of hope and healing. Many times I've talked about the incredible healing that comes from just getting together with others who have been through the fire. And the fire I speak of, for me and possibly for you, is that spiritual all-consuming fire. One that consumes only that which is not true. One that leaves only your true self. So if you're having a tough time trying to keep a grip on your identity after your loss, stick around for this episode. Rediscovering True Self in Bereavement and Grief. Okay, on to it then. I did another recent episode here on the BYOG for both men and women about the impacts of loss on a marriage, dispelling that nasty myth that loss of a child will result in divorce. In that episode, I used stats and sources and spoke of my own observations of the many grieving couples I've met over the years and found how, for the majority, their relationships were actually stronger after the loss. The love and strength they found in their partner and in themselves brought them even closer together as they began their journey of grief work. It's so hard, isn't it? Grief work, healing through this. But what once brought them together continues to see them through the devastation together. So anyway, I, I get feedback from viewers all the time and I absolutely love and appreciate it. But I had one viewer write to me and say this was all wrong. Loss of a child absolutely changes you. It turns you into someone else. And it's normal to no longer look at yourself or your partner in the same way. Now, like, again, no two of us are alike. Snowflakes and fingerprints, right? But you'll forgive me if I throw the BS flag down on this one. I say we do not fundamentally change with the traumatic death of our loved ones. I get it, though. It can sure seem that way at times, can't it? Like it changes you. Regardless, and not to go back over that episode or the ongoing conversations with that viewer that I'm having, this episode is not about your relationship with your wife or husband. It's about your relationship with you. Maybe it's time to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, right? And just know, I've been where you might be right now. And still walking my own way down my road to getting back to me. We walked together. See, when my son passed, there was that whole week where I had to make arrangements, buy a cemetery lot, and coordinate with our church. Then came the viewing and the burial services, right? And the whole time, I was surrounded by family and friends that came from around the country at the drop of a hat to support me. I was never alone during that period. But then came that inevitable morning after, the funeral hangover, I call it, when I woke up from a restless night's sleep and everyone was gone. Monday morning, I believe, and it was just me then. Now, this was not anyone's fault. They had jobs. They had responsibilities to get back to, lives to get back to that would really be no different than before they came to be at my side. And I loved them all for what they did for me. Regardless. There was no going back for me, was there? I awoke to a new life on that Monday morning, a life without my son. And he had been my world, my only child. And I had been his father. That was my identity. And I had no inclinations whatsoever of not being just that. It was my blueprint for the rest of my life. See, I expected to soon watch my 16-year-old golf phenom go off to college, hopefully on a golf scholarship, land a job after that, find a pretty young wife, and then buy a house and then come up with a few grandchildren for me to spoil rotten. Blueprints. I bet you get that, right? Well, for me, that was before a rare heart defect took my child's life. So, 
just a few weeks after the funeral hangover and living pretty much day to day in the grief cloud, I woke up one morning and had not even made it to the end of my bed before that ugly, ugly question found its way into my brain. Oh my gosh, who am I now? Does that sound familiar? I was no longer a father, I thought, and at the time, in my mind, no longer anything I had been in the past either. Yeah, that went through my mind too. See, before my son, I had been many things. I'd been a jarhead, a cop, a federal agent, a business executive. And in each job, I considered them to be who I was at the time. They were my identity. And I was proud of each. Live with them as part of my ego. Get it? Ego. But then my son came into my life, and fatherhood was something I finally hung my hat on. The one thing I was proud of in the truest sense. And I tell you, as a proud father... I had no desire of ever moving on from that title, as I had voluntarily done with the other identities in my past. I suppose now that becoming a father had at least given me one little epiphany about life, hadn't it? But then, it happened. And in my mind, fatherhood and my identity had been taken from me, against my will, mind you, and I had no idea who I was anymore. As you can imagine, it was then that I thought the bottom had truly dropped out of my life. And that's exactly why I felt the need to talk about this in an episode. To say we do not change on a fundamental level after the loss of our loved ones. Again, I'm not here to talk about the relationship issues. We've done that. I'm here to let you know we are the true us. I want you to know where to find the true you and maybe the not real true you. And please, you decide what to do with it. So... Look, I'm just going to lay it out. The good, the bad, and the ugly, I call it. Those three elements that make up you. And I believe you'll come to the same conclusion I have. We do not fundamentally change. So let's start with the good then, huh? We like starting with good stuff. The good is something I call your self-worth. And your self-worth is actually the true you. It's your morals, your basic character, and the inherent knowledge that you are a good person and a child of God, or the Creator, or the Source Energy, or the Great Gazoo. I don't care what you call him or it. Call him what you want. We all pretty much believe in that higher power, don't we? Regardless, a good self-worth means we fundamentally know and want to practice right from wrong. We are worthy. Now, a couple of things about self-worth that I need you to remember. Number one, self-worth resides in your subconscious mind, where it acts on your behalf without your conscious effort or control, like breathing or pumping blood. It is your basement level, the very foundation of who you are. See, if you think about this all as like a house, in your basement is where your water pipes, your electrical control box, hot water heater, air and heat units all sit your self-worth, your foundation. And they simply pump out what is needed to the conscious mind when it senses you need it for action. You see, a man in a burning building. Self-worth pumps out an urge for you to rush in and save him. You watch a sad movie. It sends you the urge to cry. Old lady on the street corner, give it up. You're helping her across the street. Well, that is unless you're able to suppress that urge, but then you're just being a jerk, aren't you? Anyway. The next thing you really must know is that self-worth cannot, cannot, cannot be altered once it sets. It's solid, fixed, nothing can influence. There are arguments to this, of course, but your self-worth was your programming which began and took place largely in your younger, more formative years by your parents and others who influenced your life then. Because of your upbringing, because of what you witnessed in those early years, because of what your young, hungry soul took in, this is usually what you'll carry with you through the rest of your life as a basis for you. And yeah, good or bad, let's not argue. I know there are those who came from terrible upbringing, but the vast majority of us did not. And we know inside, again, we are good and we are a child of God, the Creator, worthy, and nothing can really change that now. And you've heard the phrase I said before, the phrase, the bottom dropped out of my life. You've heard it. You probably even said it yourself in the past. I know I have. And I'm talking about before the loss of your loved one, earlier in life. 
Well, think about it. Where did you fall into when the bottom dropped out of your life then? If the bottom falls out and you go through, where did you go? You dropped into your self-worth, didn't you? You dropped into the foundational you, into the basement, and you recovered, didn't you? From that time, you thought all was lost. Follow me through this. You'll find it to be true, I know. So anyway, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I called them. If the self-worth is good, then what is the bad element? Believe it or not, it's your self-esteem. And I might be taking it a bit far by labeling it all bad, but it fits into good, the bad, and the ugly theme, so just go with me for a bit, okay? We need self-esteem, of course. It helps us hold our heads up high at times, and yes, tuck our tails in too, right? But if self-worth is the foundation, the basement, then self-esteem is the first floor, the first level of your house, and it's only seen by those inside. It's only seen by you. And the large difference between self-worth in the basement and self-esteem on the first floor, self-esteem is fluid and can be ever-changing. Look at it this way and you'll agree. Self-esteem does not live in the subconscious mind. It lives in the conscious thinking mind and tells us how good or bad we feel about ourselves at the moment. Self-esteem. It raises or lowers our thinking opinion of ourselves based on current personal successes or failures in day-to-day -day life. Again, it's fluid. You got to raise at work. You feel great about yourself. You got chewed out by the boss. You feel bad. You got a new flashy motorcycle. Good about yourself. You got your third speeding ticket this month. Bad about yourself. Here's the thing I really want you to consider though. The self-worth cannot be changed ever but it can be clouded over for a time by self-esteem, the second level, the first floor, especially when things are bad, like after the loss of a loved one. And not to throw in too many analogies, self-esteem lives in the conscious mind, but trust me, it wants badly to live and change the self-worth in the basement. You walk around with a low self-esteem long enough, and trust me, it will do all it can to cover self-worth. It can't, thank goodness, but trust me, and you know this now, continually clouding out the true you, the self-worth, is exhausting. It will take its toll on you. That is, until one day, long enough, true to what we've said in the past, the bottom might drop out, right? But again, where do you drop into? The basement. Your true self, self-worth. Get it? And when it's a strong foundation, you'll rebuild. You've done it before. Many of us have, and some unfortunately will, will do it again. So that's the good and the bad. What's the ugly then? The third element of you, the ugly, is ego, especially the unhealthy ego. See, regardless of any Merriam-Webster definitions of ego, the unhealthy one comes down to this. Living your life based on what you perceive others think of you. Not what you think of yourself, but how wonderful others think you are to feed your self-esteem. Guys, think first date here. You really put yourself out there to be quite the stud, didn't you? But while this can be a little more a guy thing, trust me, ladies, both sexes can wallow in this just as easily. We men just have a greater tendency to lean on ego. The reason I like to talk about my past as a Marine and a cop and a G-man is because I want to admit to myself and to others that there were times in my life that I lived off of what other people thought of me, not what I thought of myself. I lived on an unhealthy ego. Now, the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, considered one of the greatest modern philosophers, said it like this. Ego can be broken down to the acronym EGO, or edging got out, because we have a tendency to seek to feed the false ego. And when we do, we edge got out of our true self. The self-worth, that part of me that tells me I am a child of God or the Creator. See, when I live for the false me, I edge God out. E-G-O. Get it? But back to the sexist thing for a sec. It leads me into a funny point on all this. So, I, I think we're all aware of the number one phobia for people, right? Everyone knows what it is. What is it? Right. Public speaking. Well, except for wackos like me. Put me on a stage someplace and I'll go on for hours. Trust me, I've done it. 
I think it's from going through the death of my son now. I'm over being worried about judgment from others. I mean, there can't be anything worse happening to me than losing my child, right? So bring it, like, just bring it. <laughs> I digress, and I do that a lot. Anyway, psychologists have now broken down the top phobias or fears between males and females. Women, understandably, your biggest phobia is creepy crawly things. Bugs, snakes, critters. Makes sense, right? Heck, even we men hate them too. We just ain't as scared of them like you are. But guess what? We men have a dark, deep secret. We have a bad, scary phobia. Want to know what it is? It's the fear of being discovered that we are not who we purport ourselves to be to others. What does that mean? Will they find out I do get scared? Will they find out I'm not as smart, not as strong, not as passionate, not as faithful as I tell them or display to them that I am? Think about that, guys. And think about the fact that sometimes we're afraid we might discover that in ourselves. We are not who we tell ourselves we are. <laughs> just food for thought there, fellas. Not a sermon. Just saying. So anyway, back to it. If self-worth, our true self, is the foundation the basement of our house, and self-esteem, how we consciously feel about ourselves at the moment, is our second floor. Then ego is the roof and the siding to our personal home. It's how we are seen by others, right? But it's fair we consider this also, the healthy ego. A healthy ego is absolutely a necessary thing for each of us. It helps us fit into society, to, to coexist with others. It's what tells us how to dress for that 3 a.m. shopping trip to Walmart where you only want to fit in with the others that are there, right? Okay, too visual. It's what tells us to dress appropriately for work, to be tactful and polite to others, even when we think they are being buffoons. It is consciously coexisting with others within your society. Make sense? And I did mention consciously, didn't I? That's because the ego lives in your conscious thinking mind. And also, just like the self-esteem, an unhealthy ego will try its best to influence the self-worth, the true you. If you live long enough with an unhealthy ego, it wants to become who you truly are. Badly. But take heart, it can't. But it can help a low self-esteem put the dark cloud over your basement. Try to completely hide you the true you from the outside. So, you can imagine if everything upstairs begins to break down, your self-esteem is low, your ego is unhealthy, then what can happen? Right? The bottom can drop out of your life. It just opens up and you fall through. Can't say it enough. Remember now where you drop into. Your true self, which never changes. Can we bring that thought forward now that we've experienced the unimaginable loss of someone we love? Let's do that together. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Self-worth, self-esteem, and ego edging God out. Please consider each in your life today. Do we change after the loss of our loved one? Not our true self. It cannot happen. Enough already. I said I was just going to throw out these elements for you to consider. Your journey is an individual and personal journey, and no one can walk down your path with you. But it was nice when I found things along my healing travels that helped me make thought and map out my journey. Also, know that my intent has also been to reasonably make the statement that the loss of a loved one does not change who we fundamentally are. Granted, Self-esteem and ego might be rocked. They'll take a hit. But they are not you. Not really you. And I know it's somewhat subjective. But think about all those couples I spoke of meeting in the past. The ones who survived a loss together and told me they actually became stronger through the healing journey. I'll bet they weren't living with the good, the bad, and the ugly before it happened. Maybe it was a good, possibly a little okay, and, and maybe some healthy. If not... Maybe like me, maybe like you, they went through the fire, the all-consuming fire which burned away all that was untrue, leaving only true self. Oh, and a little full disclosure here, folks. I am a guy. I probably don't have this healthy ego thing down quite yet. 
Do you think I don't perk up at a good compliment from time to time? Try me. Please. But I'm working on it. Trying, anyway. Now, if it happens, my male ego becomes completely healthy, you come look for me on top of a mountain somewhere, probably in India, wrapped in a bedsheet and mumbling something about reincarnating into a spider monkey. Just bring bananas, please. Oh, and just so you know, I can tell you this now, and I've believed it for a long time. I am the father of Jonathan Taylor Kelly. And thank you for letting me say that. So listen, that's it for this special episode, Rediscovering True Self in Bereavement and Grief. And we are honored to have you here at the BYOG, the place where you can bring your own emotions, bring your own confusions, bring your own questions, and of course, bring your own grief. Please remember to join us on Facebook and on YouTube. Like and share us so others can more easily find all the support we offer. For now, I am Artland Kelly, father to my angel child, Jonathan Taylor Kelly, who guides me with his legacy every moment. And we both wish you peace and purpose. <laughs>